All right. Good morning. I have 8.30 on the dot, so we're going to go ahead and get started. As people trickle in, we welcome them to join us, but we are excited for the session, and we are going to get started right on time. So hello and welcome to the Patent Literacy Symposium and this session. This session is Literacy Leader Using Your Special Education Data Report, SEDR, to Improve Reading Outcomes. My name is Melissa Klug, and I am excited to facilitate this session for everybody. Before we start, we have just a few housekeeping items to review. You can access the presenter handouts for this session. Uh, the presenter bio and the conference schedule are on the patent website, and I put the link in the chat for you. You can click there. Um, just as a reminder, this session will be recorded and is 75 minutes in length, and that includes a 15-minute question and answer period at the end. Um, to access the closed captioning, just go down to the bottom of your screen. It says CC Live Transcript on the Zoom control panel. If you experience technology difficulties, please go to the technical support guides area above the schedule on the symposium page. So that's that link I put in the chat. Um, please keep your video feature off and stay muted just to eliminate any potential distractions during the presentation portion for our session. We would love for you to tweet out or share out on social media all that you're learning at the Literacy Symposium and the hashtag for this symposium is Patent Lit 2022. I'll post that in the chat in a second. But for now, I would like to introduce you to Nicole Kopko. Good morning, everyone. And just so I have an idea of who's here, I see some familiar names. I know you, you were asked to uh, turn off your video and that's perfectly fine but I do see some familiar names in our gallery. So if you could go ahead and just post in the chat where you're from, uh, just so I have a better idea of who's all here. And again, as Melissa mentioned, um, you know, this is focusing on your special education data report. Um, the second thing I kind of wanna know from you all is your familiar, familiarity with um, your special education data report. So if you could just post in the chat, like fist to five, if you will. So one, having no familiarity, three, having, um, you know, some familiarity, and then five, you can do this presentation. So I can take the back seat and go from there. So I see some fours, some threes, some ones, some twos. So we're all over the place, but um, I'm kind of a data geek, um, especially when it comes to the special education data report. So um, I uh, know this report inside and out and um, was a former director of special education. So I really, when I was in the district, I really used um, that report to kind of dictate the supports and services for students with disabilities. And I'll get, I'll dig deeply into that as we go through our session today. But um, I wanna get started. And the first thing I wanna do is just, if you're not familiar um, with our patent, hold on a second, for some reason, my, not my, okay. All right, Patton's mission is to support the efforts and initiatives of the Bureau of Special Education. Um, Patton exists as the training arm, if you will, of the Pennsylvania Department of Special Education. So as you can see here, our goal is to build the capacity of local education agencies to serve students who receive special education services. So we are fortunate in Pennsylvania um, to offer or have a statewide system of support. And that encompasses our patent system, our IUs. We have 29 IUs in Pennsylvania, if you're not familiar. And we do have our local education agencies as part of that statewide system of support. Um, again, we are very fortunate in Pennsylvania to have the structure. And that, of course, is, is supported by PD and the Bureau of Special Education. Um, so our goal for each child is to ensure the individualized education program or IEP teams um, begin with that general education setting before 
um, incorporating supplementary aids and services. So oftentimes what I would say to my staff is where is the student successful in the general education curriculum um, with, without supplementary aids and services? So that's what I wanna know from my IEP teams. Where are they successful in the general education curriculum first and foremost? And then um, where are they successful in the general education curriculum with supplementary aids and services? And then from that point, we would move into a um, potentially a more restrictive placement. Okay, some learning intentions for our uh, time together during this session. Um, it is geared towards administrators and educators who oversee and or influence uh, the K through 12 literacy program within their local education agency. And what we will be, what will, I will be speaking specifically to is that special education data report and how it translates or interprets into um, programming for students with disabilities, specifically students with disabilities in reading. So SLD and reading. Uh, attendees will explore and be exposed to the most recent Pennsylvania State Educational Data Report, often retime, uh, oftentimes referred to as the Pennsylvania CEDAR Report, as well as their own respective local ed state educational data report, which is again referred to as CEDAR, in order to address and interpret their current and future needs regarding programming for students with disabilities. Additional guidance and resources will be provided to support individual education plan teams and overall student success. The first thing I, I always like to do is um, have a warm up activity. So I'm going to actually um, uh, have you go to kahoot.it and I will launch my Kahoot to kind of get an idea of where everyone's at and. Um, I'm going to have to do a new share. Just give me a second. Okay. Oops. I don't want to go there. Log into my playlist. Apologize for the delay. I do have a list, a number CO10. There we go. This is the one I want. Start. Okay, so if you're logged into Kahoot.it, um, you're going to, um, I'm going to, this is going to give you a pin. You're going to put the pin in real quick. And you can give yourself a, a player name, if you will. Um, just keep it appropriate for this event. Nicole, we yes. can see your um, your presentation view, like all the slides. Oh, Are gotcha. You showing okay. them. So I need again? to do a new share. Is yes. what you're telling me? Yes. Okay. Perfect. Let's do that new share. There's like this really cool music. So if you didn't get your dance party on this morning, now's the time. And again, you can use nicknames, you can use your own name, you can, you know, be competitive and use like winner. Okay, we have about 30 participants, so just waiting on folks to get logged in here to kahoot.it. Put in that game or that pin number.
Okay, I have about half of you. I'm gonna give it another 30 seconds and we'll see how many folks wanna join us for Kahoot.it. I have about eight questions that I'm gonna be asking you. And again, um, I just wanna let you know to kind of you know, relieve the tension, if you will. Um, it's just true or false or truth or fib. So it's not the end all and be all. There is a little bit of competition built into Kahoot.it if you've never played it. Um, it does give you a platform at the end where you can like be it's first, second and third place. So a little podium that you'll be on if you're fast, the fast and right. <laughs> so, so accurate and, and um, quick. Okay, I have about 21 folks that are on here. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and start the game. You can always log back in if you get kicked off for some reason. Just again, that that pin number, if Melissa would put that in the chat, that way we all have it. Um, if you want to join as we get started, that's fine. Or if you get kicked off and want to rejoin, um, Melissa will have that pin number in the chat. Okay, here we go. Ready? You have about 10 seconds for each question. So 85% of children diagnosed with learning difficulties have difficulty with reading and language. That is true. So again, if you, um, so when you look at the students that you have identified on your, or, you know, um, that the CEDAR report indicates, if you have an SLD population of, let's just say, um, around 50% of students, 85% of the 50% of your students in your district um, are considered students with either reading or language processing issues. Okay, next. So, so far we have Lindsay at the top of this, the scoreboard. All right, so mid-year kindergarten scores can predict a student's third grade reading score. True or false? So almost, um, a 50-50 split, so um, not quite, but like, I guess it's um, three quarters, and, or I can't do math. Um, a third of the folks said true, and it is true, um, and, and about a third of you said false, and um, so yes, so uh, alarmingly so, mid-year kindergarten scores do uh, set the tr uh, trajectory for reading scores in you know third grade and beyond. So oftentimes we hear of committees that are formed that look at where they need to, and this is kind of alarming, where they need to build um, prisons um, in order to accommodate, you know, when when we're looking at they actually base their um, their committees base those the necessity the ne uh, necessary buildings our prisons based on third grade reading scores, which is kind of a sad um, state of affairs. So that's the importance of looking at, again, looking at um, how we go about um, implementing our program for specifically for students with disabilities. So Hay is in, uh, again, is at the top of the board here. So Let's look at the next question. The reading brain is amenable to intervention. All right, so we have most folks are saying that is true. Um, if you were in Louisa Motes' um, keynote session yesterday, 
she brought up the pictures of the brain and looking at an eight, eight week um, intervention process with um, uh, tapping into specific intervention for students. And if you noted on there, so the, the pathways in the brain can be changed based on instruction and intervention. And that is key to all of us understanding how to promote and encourage uh, specific programming to meet students' needs. Okay, so George is in the top right now. Okay, there are 44 speech sounds in English. Five of them are vowels. Oh, almost an even split. So here, this is kind of a tricky question and I apologize for that. I do that on purpose. So we have 26 letters in our alphabet. So right off the bat, children need to be taught specifics with regard to the phoneme graphing matching in regard to words and spellings of words. So there are in fact 44 speech sounds. The second part of that is not true. There are actually, um, you know, we have five vowels in the English, you know, alphabet. However, 18 sounds represent those five vowels. So that's where the tricky part comes in. So we have 26 speech sounds, or I'm um, sorry, 44 speech sounds, 26 alphabetic letters, and 18 vowel sounds that en encompass our you know, consonant and vowels. Um, so again, just so you know, it is a little bit tricky and that's why it's very important to be um, and again, Louisa Motes in her keynote addressed um, the consonant and vowel charts. Um, again, looking at those 18 vowel sounds that are part of our English language um, and that students need to be taught specifically um, with regard to those speech sounds. Okay, Willow is in the lead. Up next. Reading is a cultural in a invention. Okay, I, again, here we have about two thirds of our folks um, saying true and that is correct and about a third saying false. So I will just elaborate on this a little bit. So, um, you know, on, historically, um, the alphabetic system that we have is fairly new. Um, we only have across the world, we only have about 10,000 um, languages, if you will, that have an alphabetic system. So it is a cultural in, in, invention based on that alphabet system that we have. Um, and that's where we come up with that. It, it's a cultural in, invention, how to put how to match speech to print. And that's what we've came, we came up with as far as our alphabetic system. Okay, well, it's still on the lead. 30% of students who drop out of high school were struggling readers in third grade. Okay, and this is in, in essence a fib because it's actually 70%, which again, going back to that whole idea of kind of instilling that sense of urgency on the need to teach reading and to um, embed the science of reading in, in, in instruction in order to support our students who are struggling. This goes back to that first question about the 85% of students um, you know, that we can project, you know, out from kindergarten assessment scores, we can know that students who are in third grade, how they're going to do if we continue to provide the same instruction over that course of time from kindergarten to third grade, um, that their reading trajectories are set, in fact. 
Okay, Jen's on fire. Okay, number seven, students with comprehension issues have often have underlying issues with phonology and or decoding. That is true. And I want to emphasize that because oftentimes when students get into older grades, um, the consensus or the thought process, the theory is that um, students are having comprehension issues. Um, what we know from the research and what the research tells us and what the theoretical models tell us is that in fact, these students are having issues with phonology and or decoding, which as we continue, as we make that shift from learning to read um, to reading to learn, um, which happens, you know, sometime between second and third grade, um, definitely in the fourth grade and, and beyond, um, that students will struggle if they have underlying phonology and decoding issues because the text gets more complicated and students now um, who may have seemed okay with comprehension are now exhibiting issues with comprehension as a result of their underlying issues with phon phonology and decoding. Okay, Jen is still on fire. Okay, this is the last question. Dyslexia is a recent addition to the field of learning disabilities. Okay, and that is false. I'm glad to see so many of you said false um, because it is, it is false. It is actually in the language of um, IDEA from 2004, and which continues to be our, the, the language of the law that we continue to operate from and, and operationalize. So again, um, I just want to congratulate Jen. Um, if you want to take a picture of the screen before I um, take it off. So Jen is uh, number one on our podium. Um, number two is Willow and number three is Lindsay. So congratulations all. Thank you for in, um, engaging in this short warm-up exercise. Okay, I'm going to click out of here. All right, and I'm gonna go back to my PowerPoint. And share my screen. Okay, so back to where we were at, um, instilling this sense of urgency. And I hope that um, you were able to. Sorry, to Nicole, see. we, we yep. see the, the little slides again. Oh, sorry. So, no so, worries. Okay. I have to switch my display real yep. quick. Thank you for letting me know. Of course. Uh, we see um, the notes. Okay, perfect. I will switch that real quick. Okay. How's that? Perfect. Okay, perfect. Okay. Um, so I want to, again, just, you know, hopefully as we were going through that exercise, that warm up exercise, that you, um, you know, again, if you weren't already passionate about literacy and, and helping students to be successful, um, understanding the complexities of students with uh, disabilities specifically you know, having that large population of students that have difficulties in reading and um, language processing, hopefully that this, um, you know, that little exercise gave you an opportunity to kind of gather your thoughts around where we're at and um, what the research says. And so, again, just instilling that sense of urgency and, and crafting your vision as a leader in how you're going to go about making change um, with your, you know, whether it be your curriculum or whether it be your um, ability to change what happens in your classroom or what happens um, on a more strategic le level at the comprehensive level. Um, 
again, just some things to, to consider. So um, some of the things that I'm going to go over is what, do, what does the research say, um, which Louise and Motes kind of laid that all out yesterday, um, but we're going to, I'm going to reference her work or her, um, you know, kind of consensus around the research. What does your data tell you? So are you looking at data? Are you looking at the special education data report as a means or avenue for exploration through your administrative team, through your own lens, however that may be? Um, when are reading trajectories established? We already talked about that. Um, they are established early. And if we do, if we continue to do the same or offer the same supports and services to students with disabilities, their trajectory won't change over time. Um, so what are students, and, and what are students saying about their struggles? So are you asking, are you interviewing students that are struggling with reading and how, what are their responses and how do they feel? Because oftentimes student behaviors will bubble up or surface as a result of them not being able to read. And that you see that in our later grades, um, in, in you know, middle school and high school. So let's just take a minute to reflect on the causes of reading failure. So I have listed on the screen um, five different causes of reading failure. And what I want you to do is as you take about 10 seconds or so to reflect on those causes, and what I want to ask you, what do you think is the number one cause of reading failure? And if you could just place your response in the chat quickly. I see one, two, four, five, four, four and five, four. All right, so it looks like folks are done responding. So those of you who uh, said the number one cause is in inadequate instruction, again, would be accurate. That is the number of reading and failure. And that is not, um, again, that is not a reflection of any one of us as educators, what it is a reflection of is our prep preparation for teaching and um, being in education. So it is about the prep, you know, the preparation that we received um, in our coursework through, you know, whatever certifications that we have. And um, that's very important to acknowledge because I don't want to see this as a failure of us as educators, but rather as a failure of a system, uh, that, that preparation that we received um, in moving forward. So let me just go through, um, because people like to know, what's the order? What's the prevalence rate? So the number one cause, again, is in inadequate instruction. Number two is dyslexia or other LD. Number three is limited experience with books. Number four is cognitive or language deficits. And number five is English as a second language. So again, I just want to emphasize, if you are in a position of, say, influence, if you will, in your district or as an administrator in your district, um, I want to emphasize the importance of teacher prep programs and in emphasizing the science of reading, we have a, a number of colleges now in Pennsylvania that have, um, you know, now lean towards that preparation in, in a very matter of fact way with regard to the science of reading. Again, there are several colleges in Pennsylvania. We want to emphasize or stress a sense of urge, urgency and adequate teacher prep ongoing professional development. So that, again, that might, you know, fall on your um, shoulders to kind of, you know, influence or embed the professional development that's needed for your staff at your district. And that's certainly uh, something that we want to encourage. And also, I would encourage you 
to consider your interview process, specifically when you're interviewing for teachers who are going to be teaching reading, teaching students how to read. And then um, also, you know, even beyond that, looking at your content level teachers, um, you know, moving into middle school and high school, how do they go about ensuring that their content is accessible to students who have who might have struggles with um, reading. So again, some things to think about um, both at the administrative lens, at the classroom lens, as well as at the interview lens of um, teaching reading and teaching the science and encouraging promoting the science of reading. Some things that I just want to um, kind of, you know, put out there as far as the Florida Center for, for Reading Research. Uh, I know this, you know, looks like old data, but this is still true today. And this was called from the Reading First School Districts, um, which was a major, major to do back in the day, right? Back in the two, um, mid 2000s. And what what um, they found through the research is that successful schools have these characteristics in place. So that strong leadership, and again, this is about being a literacy leader, um, whatever you know your position or role, but it's about being a literacy leader. So strong leadership is something that is critical to the success of students, ensuring that um, students are successful in learning how to read. So that's the number one bullet there. Uh, secondly, belief that all students can learn. Again, this might be part of your mission statement. It might be part of your vision, whatever the case may be, or it might be something that, you know, you're going to look at down the road as being embedded in your procedures, processes, and practices, and that would be ideal. Uh, data, Again, that's why we're here today. You know, we're going to look at that um, CEDAR report. We're going to talk about it a little bit. And we're going to show you how to interpret that with regard to what your students' needs are in a multi-tier system of support. Um, scheduling to meet students' varied needs. Um, I know as a, a former director of special education, one of the things that I always did when there was that, you know, prior to the master schedule being like, you know, signed, sealed, and delivered, I would always have the conversation with my administrative team. The students that I need to individually and hand schedule are, you know, these are the students, this is where they need to be, especially at the um, middle school and high school level. We really need our hands on that to ensure that they get the support they need to be successful. Scheduling to me, I, I, I just said that. Continual professional development, that needs to be part of your comprehensive plan. That needs to be embedded in that comprehensive plan. Um, there is that individual section that covers professional development. You know, be a part of that discussion, be a part of that um, support for your administrative team if you're at that level, if you're at the classroom level you know, be the bug in somebody's ear that will listen to you about how you can impact that, you know, that strategic plan and to ensure that not only you receive the professional development, you need to ensure the science of reading is embedded, but also any, you know, uh, teachers that are hired, um, you know, after everybody gets that, you know, big round of professional development, you know, if you're adopting a new curriculum or whatever the case may be, how are people then, you know, what is your plan for ensuring those folks that are hired after that big to do um, in, you know, ensuring that they receive the professional development and or support that they need in moving forward and ensuring that um, the, the practices are appropriate in the science of reading. Again, scientifically, scientifically based intervention programs and, you know, parent involvement is also key um, because they can be your biggest supports, your biggest allies when it comes to ensuring that students are practicing the skills that they learn 
um, throughout the school day. Okay. Uh, one of the one of the most um, and and Louisa said this in her keynote yesterday, but. You know, I, I attended a session, this was some time ago with Louisa, um, I want to say it was the IDA conference, I could be wrong, but this was many years ago, probably IDA um, 2008 or later. Um, but Dr. Louisa Motes, um, and she said this in her session yesterday, she refers to the foundational understandings of the science of reading as settled science. That was quote, end quote, um, she refers to th this work as settled science. Like, there are so many studies that were, um, that looked at what are the essential components of reading instruction. And that came out of the um, National Reading Panel report from 2000. And they did a meta-analysis, and I, I forget how many studies, but it was over 115,000 studies they, they looked at. And then they, they narrowed that down to 800 and some, some studies that met the requirement for being peer-reviewed, right? And so what they gleaned from that then were the five big ideas. So phonics, phonemic awareness, fluency, vocabulary, and comprehension. They said, these are essential components of reading instruction. These are the things that need to be embedded to ensure that students are successful. So as Louisa said in her keynote yesterday, and as um, we're looking at here today, these foundational understandings, they haven't changed for now what is over 40 years of reading research. And um, so there's no need, and Louisa said this again yesterday, there's no need to continue to study this. We know this to be fact, okay? Um, so again, I just wanna you know, reiterate that, that we need to um, ground ourselves in the foundational understandings. Um, you know, the importance again, that those reading trajectories are set early on we know that that there's a uh, you know an element of an importance or urgency around that first instruction. There are theoretical models that drive um, the research that happened forty some years ago and the research that happens today. Um, folks continue to say that these theoretical models hold up to scientific scrutiny. Um, we also have you know. In early research, we had folks doing functional MRIs um, scans to see what happens in the reading brain. Um, as Louisa Moat shared yesterday in her keynote, um, definitely there are pathways that light up in the brain that address um, the differences between a, a, a student who has um, proficient skills versus a student who is struggling, right? So there's different pathways in the brain that kind of light up when a student is engaged in reading. We look for the pathways to be, um, you know, we know from the research, we look for pathways to be succinct and we know when um, things are off uh, based on fMRI scans. So again, just you know, expressing that sense of urgency. One of the handouts that I gave you, um, you know, you do have a PDF of this PowerPoint, but one of the, you know, um, one of the pieces that I want to share with you and that you have a handout of are the theoretical models. These again, these hold up to scientific scrutiny. Um, it's something that um, you know, researchers from 40 plus years ago and, and researchers from today continue to um, evolve their thinking and evolve their processes and the research around these theoretical models because they have held up to the test of time, to scientific scrutiny over time. And um, you can see, pro I want to just kind of as a fist of five again, I just want to acknowledge what your familiarity is with these different models. So first thing, Scarborough's reading rope. How many of you, um, again, one being no familiarity, three being some, and then five being, you know, extreme familiarity. 
I know it and I can do it. I understand it. So if you can just put that in the chat. Okay, I see some threes, some twos, some fives. Okay, five, five, five. Okay, so it looks like, you know, again, we have quite the range of folks. Um, Scarborough's reading rope. And um, again, this is something that if you were in Joan Subita's session, she kind of did um, a spinoff on Scarborough's re reading rope, but she looked at, um, and this was yesterday, she looked at the writing rope, um, which she focuses on uh, the writing area. So again, some of the things that we know, um, and again, that this is, I, I believe this is from 2000, yeah, it's from 2001, Paula Scarborough um, created this reading rope to actually explain to parents how students learn to read and um, all the facets of reading. Um, and so you can see here, there are two main sections, if you will, language comprehension and word recognition. Um, and you can see all the different elements or components of each of those um, domains, if you will, of language comprehension and reading comprehension that go into reading. At the top part of the rope, um, language comprehension, these are kind of twisted together. And what I like to tell folks, if you if you have long hair, if you have a child with long hair, and you've I you know if you twisted their hair it's really hard to tell one end from the other. So it's not, it's not um, as neat and clean to measure these different components of language comprehension. They're all kind of meshed together. Um, once you twist somebody's hair, it's really hard to tell one end from the other, okay? Um, so we need to understand that these can't be necessarily, these um, different, facets or components of language comprehension cannot be isolated. They cannot be isolated and measured, and measured as easily as the word recognition pieces. So if you see at the bottom part of the rope, it's braided. Now in a braid, when I'm braiding my granddaughter's hair, I can actually, you know, take apart each section of that braid, right? So they, these word, word recognition pieces they can be isolated and measured easily. So it's a lot more um, comfortable, if you will. And going back to that warm up, you remember that I said, oftentimes kids will have underlying, you know, kids that are popping up in middle school and high school as having comprehension issues, oftentimes have those underlying phonological and decoding issues that um, were, you know, kind of passed by in the early grades because they were successful comprehenders as far as listening comprehension. Um, so we didn't notice it as much. Um, whereas again, word recognition, you can isolate and measure each of these skills. And that's important to know, again, with Scarborough's rope. Going on to the four-part processing model, how, let's see your familiarity in the chat again. Okay, lots of fours and fives. All right, so just, just to, you know, again, um, these models can actually be um, placed over top of one another, mapped onto each other, because if you look again, your word recognition skills are really, if you look on, on the screen here, they're really uh, focusing on the phonological process, processor and the orthographic processor. And what helps us to understand in the, in the um, reading brain is that the phonological processor and the orthographic processor are bridged by phonics. Phonics is the instruction that needs to occur for us to map the sounds of our language onto the graphemes of our language. So the sounds, meaning phonemes or phonological processor, mapped onto the sounds or, or um, mapped onto the letters or letter patterns in our language through the orthographic processor. And again, that is through our phonics instruction. 
one of the things to, to note in the four-part processing system, this is not linear. You can see the arrows going back and forth. So as we are fluent readers, these processes take place in the brain without, it's, it's with automaticity, without any issues for us as fluent readers. If you, and what's missing from here is, is the line of fluency. So if I were to be able to draw a line, I would have this line of fluency, which would be, fluency would be embedded in each of the processors. It's not in isolation. It's not, again, this is not a linear model. Our brain constantly sends uh, chemical energy back and forth the whole time we're reading and processing information that we're um, getting as we read. Okay, next one, the simple view. It is truly a simple view. How many, can you put in the chat what your familiarity is with the simple view? Five, 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 okay. Okay, great. So the important piece of this model, this theoretical model, is simply this is a math, yeah, um, uh, multiplication problem, if you will. Okay, so if I were to say word recognition times language comprehension equals reading comprehension, if I would put this into numerical terms, if I had a zero in either word recognition or language comprehension, what would what would happen to reading comprehension? Just throw it in the chat. If you could just say, if I had zero in either place, yes. So Jan is saying language comprehension would also be zero. You know, so again, if you had a zero in either word recognition or language comprehension, reading comprehension would be zero or null, not, not existent. So again, the importance of these models is to say that we need both word recognition and language comprehension to be successful, skilled, fluent readers. Um, so if we have issues or difficulties or skill deficits in any one of these areas, these domains, again, going back to Scarborough's rope, going back to the simple view, if we have skill deficits, we're going to struggle with reading comprehension. And that's why going back again to our warm up exercise. So again, if folks are you know, saying, oh, this student has comprehension issues, it's actually an underlying issue with phonology or, or um, language processing, okay? And last but not least, we have Aries phases of word reading. Oh, I don't know what I just did. Okay, you guys are still okay. You can see my screen. Yes, okay, perfect. All right, so Aries phases of word reading is just a really nice way to look at how students develop from pre-alphabetic stage all the way to consolidated alphabet. And what's nice about this is that as you're teaching or you know, if you're programming for students with disabilities, you're going to be able to see where kids land in these various phases. The best way to do that is to look at sample writing and um, to analyze their student um, work samples that way to look at, okay, oh, this, this child is absolutely in, you know, the, um, you know, phonological or leader alphabetic phase, they're starting to match sounds to letters and so forth. Um, and so you can kind of see that evolve over time, it, it, especially if you're a teacher of the early grades, but you might even see that at, you know, the middle school level where you're starting to, you know, kids are struggling with their writing. Um, you'll start to, you know, be able to help them to to process and to analyze their work as they're as you're looking at their uh, writing samples. So it's a great uh, another great resource to look at their their writing. So okay. All right. I mentioned um, as we did the warm up exercise. I mentioned that um, you know. Uh, the whole idea of dyslexia is not new. 
uh, um, it was established with the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act of 2004. Um, you can see it here in the exact verbiage from the language of the law. Um, under specific learning disability, it again is identified as an example. Uh, dyslexia is an example of that. Um, there are 13 categories of special education disabilities is de defined by IDEA. In order to qualify for special education, the IEP team must determine that a child has one of the 13 disabilities. It is important to note that dyslexia was and always has been part of the language of IDEA since 2004. As noted from this regulatory language of IDEA, dyslexia is considered an example of a specific learning disability as outlined on the slide. Additional guidance on dyslexia, dyscalculia, and dysgraphia can be found in the Department of Ed Dear Colleague letter that was issued on October 23rd, 2015. And there was also a subsequent pen link that followed that was issued on um, pen link for Pennsylvania that was issued on December 1st. The, D, uh, the Department of Ed and Pennsylvania Department of Ed reiterated that in no way have LEAs ever been told not to use the terms of dyslexia, dyscalculia, and or dysgraphia when evaluating, assessing, or programming for students with disabilities, and, and, and it is more than appropriate to do so. Parents should not be told that we don't use those terms. Um, if, if it's relevant to the student, then we wanna make sure that we um, use those terms. Furthermore, parents should understand that dyslexia is an example of the spe specific learning disability in reading and that LEAs can provide effective supports and services to meet the needs of their child accordingly. If you want to also furthermore, another resource for you is um, the International Dyslexia Association. I'm gonna apologize in advance because this is not their um, website, but if you do Google, um, you will find the International Dyslexia Association. This is um, a, an old uh, resource from 2016, but the important point I wanna note is about 13 to 14% of the school population nationwide are identified as having a disability that qualifies them for special education services. Um, I just want to note that because that's very critical when we're starting to look at the um, CEDAR report, which I, I'll show you in a minute here. One half of all students who are identified for a special education are classified as having a learning disability. So again, this is some older data from 2016. Our numbers are a little bit better now, and we'll go over that in a minute. About 85% of those students have a primary learning disability in reading and language processing. And up to 15 to 20% of the population as a whole may have symptoms of dyslexia, including slow or inaccurate reading, weak spelling, and poor writing. Not all will qualify for special education, but most benefit from, again, um, you know, we're, we're not in the business of doing harm to children. So, most children will benefit from a systematic explicit instruction in reading, writing, and language, otherwise known as structured literacy. There is, um, you know, operational or working definitions, um, you know, and dyslexia has a working definition that has been adopted by the um, board of the uh, IDA board of directors. And that was adopted in November 12, 2002 and continues to hold true to this day. I think the biggest thing that I wanna note on this slide is the importance of recognizing that students with dyslexia have difficulty with accurate and fluent word recognition, poor spelling and decoding, de deficits in phonological component of language, problems in reading comprehension. Again, that's produced at a later time. You won't see that early on, and I'll get back to that. Reduced reading experiences um, because they don't like to read, because you know they can't make sense of what they're reading. Um, 
you know, or they can't read the words. Um, impeded growth of vocabulary and background knowledge. And again, that happens over time as a student continues to not be successful with decoding and phonological processing. So one of my favorite um, slides, if you will, or one of my favorite um, continuums in theoretical models, again, this is based on this simple view of reading, um, but this is, you know, acknowledging that first and foremost, all of us, not just children, we all vary on a continuum of reading ability. Um, and over time that, that does change or shift based on our experiences and our successes. And so if you see, um, if you're looking at this slide and I want you to take about 30 seconds to reflect um, on this slide. So you can see the different areas, the different quadrants, if you will. Um, so I want to acknowledge what do you think is the highest prevalence rate? So just put in the chat. You can just use initials. So GC for good comprehension, P um, for, you know, P for poor word recognition. Okay, I see. Okay. All right, so I'm just gonna click through this. Um, so the highest prevalence rate for our students with disabilities is going to be in that mixed category of both poor word recognition and poor language comprehension. So when you're looking at students with disabilities, this is gonna be your highest group. You're gonna have the most students that are going to fall into this category when they're identified as students with specific learning disability or um, students with, it could be students with OHI, it can be students with emotional disturbance, but for the most part, this is where your highest group is gonna be. Your second highest group is going to be um, your uh, students with good language comprehension and poor word recognition. And your smallest group is going to be those students who are good word callers, you know, what, what is ref often referred to as hyperlexic. Um, unfortunately, what happens over time is these students who have good, you know, appear to have good decoding, they can, you know, say the words on the page over time or as we continue to, you know, go through the grades these students will slide into that um, quadrant of the mixed broad category and same with these students. So that's what will happen over time. Um, I mentioned this earlier. I said about, you know, these, these types of, um, you know, this, this gap grows over time. It does, you know, those re reading trajectories are set early on. Um, and here's kind of what you would expect to see um, at their early grade level. So grade one, um, they would need core instruction plus 30 minutes to 40 minutes of additional intervention um, to catch up to their peers. Um, if you see in the later grades, as, as late as third grade, you're looking at a gap of about um, two and a half to three hours of intervention needed for those students. So again, that continues, that gap continues to grow if nothing changes over time. Okay, couple of things I wanna tell you about the special education data report. We have the state educational data report. Um, again, right now I mentioned that this is not at 30% anymore. It's actually um, at 39.8%, which is about 40%. Um, so again, when I look at this, I say across Pennsylvania, I have 40% of my students who are struggling um, or who are identified as, as having a specific learning disability. Of those 40% of students, I need to recognize that 85% of the 40% of students are considered to be at risk for reading um, and language processing. So that's just in one category. We have 13 categories of disability. 
So again, I like to point out to folks, you need to be looking at your other health impaired because sometimes students are identified as OHI, oftentimes those students who qualify um, as having um, ADD or ADHD, so attention deficit disorder or attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, sometimes they also have reading and language processing issues. Another category is emotional disturbance. All these categories could have issues with reading, but the biggest group of students you're going to see in your districts that you need to um, look at programming for are going to be the students with specific learning disabilities. Um, again, knowing that 85% of whatever your percentage is, is going to be um, have struggle with reading and language processing. I'm going to skip through because we're actually running out of time. Um, taking action, again, although dyslexia and re related reading and language problems are may originate with neuro neurobiological differences, they are mainly treated with skilled teaching. And that's, you know, when I had that warm up exercise, the reading brain is amenable to change. And that's the importance of having skilled instruction because we can um, be able to target, pinpoint, and adapt our instruction to meet the needs of all students. Um, just again, going uh, with a philosophy of instructional matching and then prescriptive teaching could, because one size does not fit all. So you can see here this model, um, prescriptive teaching in the middle. Um, we need to assess to pinpoint those skill deficits, match that instruction to meet student needs, provide that prescriptive teaching, and then monitor pro progress. And you can see this is never ending. This is cyclical because we need, um, again, we need skilled instruction that meets the needs of students. And we have to do that through this kind of process. Um, again, this is just a list format of the, the, the model that I just showed you. And that's just my model uh, on how I think. Um, but we need to determine our student needs, match instruction, teach the program with fidelity, use formative assessment, monitor progress, and make timely decisions. And again, it's just important to note, and I have a little resource here, um, the core assessing reading multiple measures is a great resource. It's, it's fairly cheap. It's like 40 bucks, I think. Um, do you have multiple measures? Uh, and teachers can do this. Anybody, you know, like, um, any professional can give these assessments. Um, do you have multiple measures and how do you uh, promote and encourage that assessment piece? So some things to think about, um, and, and this is also this um, IDA knowledge and practice standards for professional development. This is um, a resource that I've attached to this session. Um, the IDA Knowledge and Practice Standards, there's actually a couple different documents. The one I gave you is for educators in general. Um, certainly use that as a resource. Maybe look at that for a PLC type of opportunity um, with, you know, to encourage that professional development piece or ongoing professional development. Okay, last but not least, um, you know, I just want you to think of some things here. We're at the question and answer portion of our, our time together. Um, what are some things that square with me? So if you can put that in the chat. Okay, um, if you could just put in the chat any of those things, what are some very important, important points that you um, gleaned from this presentation? And is there anything that's still circling around in your head? So th those would be questions. This is, again, the Q&A portion of our time together. Okay, um, Tiffany says Scarborough's reading rep is new to me. Thank you, Tiffany. Um, I hope you gained some insight into that. Uh, Beth, um, something that's square with you is ongoing urgency and depth of need and literacy and intervention. Thank you, Beth. Uh, George is saying reading is amenable to change and interventions need to be implemented to improve outcomes, reading failures, so forth. Um, square, the reading models, the theoretical models, 
Absolutely. That is a great conversation to have with your staff if you're in that position or with your um, department team or however. Um, it's great to look at those models in depth and kind of like how that translates into your instruction and programming for students with disabilities. Circle, time. What have you learned about finding time for these students in a very packed schedule? So I think one of the number one things that we always look at in education is that time element, right? That time. Um, what I would encourage you is to have conversations um, with your team, with your administrators, um, in, in order to ensure the time is available to you um, through PLCs, through professional development, um, for again, scheduling for those students who do um, need extra time. Uh, something that square comprehension concerns can stem from gaps in early literacy skills. Absolutely. Yeah, that, you know, that is something that the research has held, you know, again, like, like uh, Louisa Metz says, that settled silence, that foundation, those foundational under, understandings, they don't change. So we know those reading trajectories, if we do nothing or continue to do the same, we will get the same result, which will increase that gap over time and um, have students struggle, continue to struggle th well throughout their uh, school careers. Okay. Okay, if there are no other questions, I do want to acknowledge that I do have resources, um, you know, at, on the last slide. And you do, again, you have the PDF of this presentation, but we have many, many, many resources on our, uh, you know, uh, on our patent, you know, um, homepage. But then uh, our patent literacy page, we also have additional, you know, tons of resources on there and uh, different uh, professional development opportunities, trainings and so forth through our calendar. Um, we also have, um, we launched the patent literacy hub um, during the time of the pandemic. And as we continue to come, kind of come out of that place, but our, our Google site, um, again, we continue to house all literacy resources that we have vetted. Um, so it's a, like a one-stop shop. Um, we will continue to, you know, house the resources that we that we've provided through these presentations for the symposium and so forth, and all of our um, attached resources for each session. Um, also, I mentioned the International Dyslexia um, uh, Association, and that you can see that that's the actual website. Um, I mentioned it did change from 2016, so. Um, you can see that on um, on here. Teresa, you have one more question. Um, Melissa, how are we on time? I can hang hang in. You're good. Yep, go okay. ahead. Okay, Teresa, um, is retention in early grades beneficial to struggling students? So here's what I'll say to that, because again, my um, passion and compassion is um, special education. So I, especially if you're looking at students, um, who are struggling, who have been identified as a student with a disability, um, you know, I would always want to work with the family, um, you know, to on a reasonable solution. Um, from all the research I've read, and, and, and you all might, might have a difference of opinion, but from the research that I read, there's not a lot of benefit to retention. Um, maybe in the early grades, it's just not as noticeable because, you know, the kids are all young and they don't, you know, they're new to the school experience. So the impact isn't as significant. So it, like, I know personally, I have a sister, um, who had twins and her one child, um, has been, um, just recently been di diagnosed with, as a student with autism and she chose to hold her children back. So again, I think, I think you can work with a family to come to whatever is the best solution um, for that child. Um, because I would hate to say, you know, I'm either for or against. Um, I'm kind of, I, I'm straddling the fence because I do think it's a family decision. I do think it's a, a school decision. I would hate to see a student who is struggling um, be retained specifically just because they're struggling in reading, I would I would want to 
factor in a little bit more to that. And I'd also want to make sure, ensure that we had the supports and services in place for to meet the students' needs. Thanks again for all your um, participation today. All right, thank you so much. So thank you, Nicole, and to all of you who attended this wonderful session today. The session recording will be available on the Patent YouTube channel in the near future.